Check, 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 test, test. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and um, kind of get started here. Um, so my plan was to uh, go over maybe the support vector machine materials a little bit. Okay, I had a few announcements. Uh, maybe I should uh, post these um, online as well here. Uh, actually, I might do that here um, after I mention these, unless I get a few people to join here before I'm I'm. Uh, done talking about these. So um, the, uh, the the fourth assignment is available now. So you should go ahead and get it and start working on it. So it's it's on support vector machines. Um, so there's always been the assignment in the repository. So so if you if you went um, and opened up your dev box and um, looked on the assignments, it was there, but um, um, you did, and I, I fixed a few things, I updated a few things, so you do need to do a, a Git poll, okay? So um, you should be able to do this from a terminal, you know, so um, if you go to your host machine and do a Git poll, it should pull it down for you. Um, and But I, I think you can also do it from a terminal, you know, inside of your, uh, um, dev box as well, right? So if you don't open up a terminal inside of your virtual machine, uh, the same thing should happen. Although from here, you would have to be um, in the, um, for, in both cases, you have to be in the, the directory where you're, you know, that, that's the um, inside of your repository. So um, if you're in the ML Python class, I think you, should, you can do a get pull from there as well. Um, to pull the things down, so. Um, so, but yeah, tell me, yeah, if it doesn't work, um, you might have to do it from your host machine, possibly, so. Um, here, they're just complaining, I guess, that we might have to configure these first. I didn't think you'd have to do this to do a get pull, but um, um, let's see if I go ahead and configure these, if I can get it to, pull down the updated assignment here. So, um, oops. So let's do I mean, try to figure both of these things here. There, so uh, try it one more time. So you should be able to do a poll. Oh, um, yeah, if you're getting things about the, the branch merging or something, um, you might have local changes that are in conflict here. So uh, you might not want to merge that. So. See what changes I got here. Um, Um, yeah, so 
if you have problems with that, let me know, but um, probably it would be safest uh, to do the Git pull from, um, go, go to your host machine, uh, change into your repository um, directory and, and do the Git pull from there. So that should get down the latest version of the assignment. So um, a quick way to check that once you pull it down is um, you should have the correct date for 2021. So again, like I said, like I was saying, you know, I've made a few corrections on the assignment, uh, the next assignment here. So, um, so you, you want to pull that down, make sure you have the, the, the one for this fall. And then, um, um, and then I was going to talk about it a little bit here, maybe today. Actually, I'll talk a little bit about support vector machines in general, and then maybe we'll get and see if there's um, some things we can talk about the assignment specifically here. So, all right, um, I made this assignment for due, so you've got um, um, two weeks still. Um, so we are looking at, at support vector machines this week, um, and it's not due till Sunday of uh, the week after. So, um, so just looking ahead here, um, yeah. So we are on November first here, looking at support vector machines, um, and uh, we are kind of uh, getting towards the end of things. So uh, we're going to be looking at. Uh, um, ensembles and decision trees um, for the next two weeks after that. And then that kind of wraps up looking at supervised learning uh, uh, mechanisms. So, so, so looking at supervised learning and machine learning. And then after that, we'll kind of change gears a little bit and look at some unsupervised learning. So that, that encompasses things like dimensionality reduction um, and um, um, some other things. Yeah. All right, so anyway, that's, that's what we're coming up with uh, here in the next couple of weeks. Um, so I thought I'd go ahead and look through the notebook because I, yeah, I don't think I have um, a canned lecture on this. Um, uh, any more here. Um, um, there is some lectures, so I'd encourage you uh, if you want some some lectures from Dr. Ng um, on the support vector machine, you should probably look up his lectures. So he'll have uh, more details about some of these things here as well. Uh, of course, you should also be reading through our textbook. Um, um, so we're on like what chapter five of our um, 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 of the um, hands-on machine learning textbook here. So I need to update some of that. Okay, let's let's go ahead and look at uh, the lecture notebook then here. So. Keep everything rerun cleanly. Uh, oh, um, hmm. okay. So yeah, there's not a whole lot in this lecture notebook. I thought there was some more stuff in it. Maybe I should bring up the uh, the textbook uh, instead here. Um, so yeah, these are just a few of the examples from our, our chapter five from our textbook here. So um, let me go and bring up the textbook. Um, maybe look at that to discuss a few things. So, um, Okay. 
Um, so, port vector machines um, are uh, a type of machine learning algorithm that gone on out of favor a little bit. So at one time they were kind of the, the leading, uh, um, you know, the, the the model that would often perform the best, right? So they've been they've been superseded a bit by uh, deep learning um, for one, but uh, in general, I mean, um, um, uh, nowadays like some ensembles of trees, um, so, so like boosting and stacking and stuff will often do um, uh, quite a bit better than than a a generic support vector machine. Um, so. But they're still a pretty powerful method, and um, they, um, they they really work um, we're, th these are back to um, behind the scenes. Th these work in similar ways to the, our linear regression that we were looking at before. So these really are parametric models. Um, so when you're fitting a support vector machine classifier, um, or you can you can actually use support vector machines for um, um, regression problems as well. Um, is that right? I believe so. Uh, but but yeah, let's let's stick to classification right now. So uh, if you're fitting it for to do a, a classification problem, um, um, you will be you know defining a fitness function and then uh, running some sort of an optimization method to uh, fit the parameters, okay? So um, our textbook talks a little bit about the differences between the SVM classifier um, and like a, a standard, um, say, um, logistic regression. So, so I guess we should probably be comparing this to logistic regression since we're talking about classification here, right? So remember, logistic regression is a type of classifier, actually, um, although the name uh, um, is a little bit badly named here. So, so if we're thinking about classification, um, This is, uh, I think, in, in Dr. Ng's uh, lectures, um, this is known as the large margin intuition, right? So the idea behind, you know, before we get into talking about the, the details of how this works, you know, um, as, a, as a model or mathematically, what you want to do for support vector machines is you want to find um, A, um, a separator. So you want to find a um, decision boundary that gives the largest margin um, on the classifier, right? So, so, I mean, here's a bunch of, of different, uh, on this um, figure here, of a possible, of, uh, possible decision boundaries, right? Um, You know, so you might get decision boundaries like these. Um, um, and, and, you know, these decision boundaries are perfectly fine. They, they you know, for, for two classes, these two classes are pretty easily separable, right? So like the, the purple and the red decision boundaries would, would still be working perfectly for both of these, right? Uh, but the, the issue with these uh, is that um, they might not be good at generalizing, right? So, so, so if you have, have things that are well separated like this, um, Intuitively, what you want is a decision boundary that will maximize. You know, so, so basically, you know, when we say large margin classifier, the, it will get the, the largest spacing between it um, and the closest point to the um, um, to the decision boundary, right? Um, So that was the kind of where the, the name support vectors and support vector machine comes from, right? So if you add more um, training instances, it won't really affect this large margin. The, 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 the largest margin is only affected by the two closest points basically 
to the decision boundary on either side of um, the decision boundary that we want to um, define, right? So, so if you kind of find these two closest points, um, um, these will end up specifying what the support vector is. Um, so, so, so it, it really has to do with, with the, the points that are close together on the edge of the streets as our textbook talks about here, right? And I'm talking really generally here. I mean, we, we can formalize this. And so basically what the support vector machine um, fitness function does is it formalizes this idea so that you can then try and find um, such a decision boundary that, that meets this, you know, that, that um, 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 this idea of the support vector, right? So it's finding the supporting vector that, that maximizes the, the margin uh, here, right? Um, so, it's not often the case for classification problems that you actually have things that are completely separable like this, right? So if they are completely separable, um, you know, you can do hard margin classification in that case. So, so you can actually find a support vector that will uh, um, cleanly uh, linearly separate the variables, right? So, so, so this, this kind of a, like a hard margin like this is only possible, um, you know, like it's saying here, when um, um, the data is truly linearly separable, right? Um, so when the data isn't actually completely separable, kind of like, like in this case, so, so if we have exactly the same things, but we have this outlier point here, um, we can't really use a hard margin, you know, right? So, so, you know, um, because there is no linear, uh, boundary, linear decision boundary um, that can get all these points on one side of it and all the, the blue points on, on the other side of it here, right? Um, so this is, where, this is where one of the parameters comes in for the support uh, vector machine. Um, so, so normally we are going to do soft margin classification, you know, because things usually aren't completely linearly separable like this anyway. Um, um, and, and, you know, one of these parameters will allow us to, to have a balance between keeping the street as large as possible uh, and limiting margin violations. Okay, so, so for soft margin classifications, we might allow some values to be inside, so, so some of these values to be inside of the, the street as, as our textbook talks about it here, right? Or on the wrong side of, of the street even, so, right? Um, and by doing that, we can basically ignore some points and then try and find the, a good um, support vector anyway. So a good decision boundary that, that kind of ignores maybe some of the points, right? because some of the points could be outliers or some of the, the, the points might not be worth considering um, because they, um, you know, we, we, the intuition is that we want to um, consider the majority of the points to find a good decision boundary um, and, and a good uh, support vector um, that, 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 that Phil gives a solution for like a linear, um, decision boundary that, that um, separates a lot or majority of the points, maybe not 100% of them, but a lot of them, right? And does it um, to the best of the ability to, to keep a good um, um, you know, um, separation between the one, the points that we're keeping within our support vectors here. All right. Um, so anyway, uh, in practical terms, there's a parameter called C, uh, and it's that value that we modify um, in order to make it more or less soft for the support vector machine classification.
Um, basically, for small values of C, um, um, that um, allows for a softer solution, right? So small values of C are um, um, actually allowing for more violations uh, in here in the support vector that's ultimately found by the solution. Uh, and if you make C bigger though, um, you're gonna force it to have less violations and, and big C's will end up um, um, trying to get it down to like a hard, um, classification, right? Um, although again, you know, it, it might not, if, if the problem isn't linear separable, linearly separable, then there might not be any actual solution, but a hard C will, will get as close to, you know, uh, uh, some linear separable as it can, basically. So, um, Um, oh, so something I should have mentioned before we got into this. So, so we're mostly talking about uh, doing what's known as linear classification here. So we're, we're actually um, creating a decision boundary that's a line or a plane, right? So, so, so we're using a linear decision function um, um, to, to, to separate up our space uh, into the, the different areas that we'll use for the classification, okay? So later on, so, so you know, uh, uh, I'm kind of like doing the, uh, the, the the polynomial trick that we've been doing a lot for, for the uh, linear regression in order to be able to fit sort of a nonlinear function. Um, we can do a similar thing using uh, what are known as kernels. Um, so, so the kernel trick is how we make nonlinear uh, support vector machines. And in general, we can kind of do the same idea for other machine learning algorithms. But, but yeah, let's, let's talk about kind of in the second half of the chapter five here. Um, all right, so this, this example here was probably the, the first example that we kind of put over into the um, um, notebook that we had in there. So, So in this case, you know, we're using the iris data set that we've used before as an example for classification. So we use this um, a lot, or this is used a lot in our textbook uh, to, to um, give examples of classification problems and, and, and algorithms that are doing classification, right? Um, so in the iris data set, uh, again, we've got four uh, actual classes here. Um, Um, although again, we're turning this we're turning this into a binary classification task, so we're just doing Virginica, not Virginica, um, in this case here. Um, oh, as is mentioned, um, support vector machines are um, oops, are very um, sensitive to scaling, right? So this is one of those that. Um, 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 one of the machine learning algorithms that we learn about here that you really do need to make certain you scale it before you uh, apply a support vector machine to it um, or you won't get as good results or, or you won't get results at all if you don't do the scaling, right? So our textbook talks a little bit about, you know, why you really need to support scale um, support vector machines here. So, um, so I, because of that, you know, so we're in this example from our textbook, we're showing that we first um, go through a standard scalar before we apply a linear support vector classifier. So SVC stands for support vector classifier in this case. Um, notice um, on the loss function, um, that we can specify loss functions um, like uh, hinge and thing. Um, so 
the oh no, I, I meant to um um so so the hinge loss is the 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 default. Um, I meant I meant to point out um, that um, I mean you can use uh, besides the C parameter. Um, which is a regularization parameter, you can also specify the L1 and L2 regularization as well for support vector machine. And it works, uh, those work in pretty similar ways uh, to what we talked about for linear regression so far, okay? So these, are, these apply a penalty basically to the size of the weights uh, when you're doing regularization, so. Um, Remember, our textbook talks a little bit about uh, what the hinge loss function is. So, so you know, you know what a loss function is. Uh, that that's your fitness function um, um, that we've talked about here, right? So, the, so the hinge loss is a specific form of a fitness function for support vector machines, basically. Um, all right. Anyway. Um, um, with that kind of as as prelude, um, we can you know uh, scale our data and then fit it to our um, linear support vector classifier here in the usual way, right? So the um, SVM classifier here is using the a linear support vector classifier. Um, we're using a small c here, right? So again, this makes it more soft. Um, so, you know, this is, this is, you, can, you can think of this as another type of regularization parameter, like the L1 and L2 uh, penalties that we've seen before. So now we've got C for the support vector machines. Um, So uh, you know, once you set up the pipeline, you can fit it, um, and then once you fit the model, um, you can use it in the ways that we've used before, so to make predictions um, and to um, then do all the other things that we've seen before, um, you know, like um, get them say a confusion matrix, um, uh, here we're plotting the decision boundary, okay, so between Virginica and not Virginica, uh, using this particular C, uh, again, these, these two are not linearly separable, so we get our decision boundary uh, right here um, uh, between these, so we get the, you know, a couple four points over here and, and a couple three here, so we can't get a perfect one between these two classes. Uh, using just these two features, um, but um, but this is the best that we can get. You can try playing around with the C, right? So um, so for example, it's useful to look at what happens if you um, say try a large C, like like we're showing in our textbook, right? So here. Um, Um, in this case, we might not see a real big difference on, on the resulting decision boundary, but, uh, but again, what should be happening for a large C um, is we're going to try and reduce the, uh, the, the, the margin violations, right? So um, we'll end up with a smaller margin um, and less points in there. Um, so um, uh, we'll be throwing away. Basically, we don't consider points that are inside of the margin uh, for the support vector. Uh, we, we only consider the closest points that are outside of the margin that results to define the support vector, which defines the decision boundary for a support vector machine here. So, um, so, if we run again using like a higher C, let's run all the cells above this up to that point then. We fit our model. So 
And then if we um, try and look at that, you know, um, it didn't, you, know you might not see a big difference because we, we can't exactly tell, what, for example, what the size of the margin is. Um, Although I suppose you know, there, there's as usual, there's ways to find the uh, the details of, of the fit of the model here, um, you know, like um, like finding the coefficients and stuff like that, um, um, from which we could probably find the the details of the the margin that was was fit by our hinge loss function here and other information. So. Um, Let's, for example, if I'm bringing up the contextual help here, you know, so, so when we were doing uh, linear regression, you know, we had things like the coefficients. So we've got those for a support vector machine. Um, um, but, but yeah, we've got the support vectors here. So presumably if, I, if we dug into it, um, uh, we could use this to find out the, um, um, the, the support vectors and the margin um, that was found. Uh, this case here, right? So, so yeah, we've got things like uh, for this model, we've got um, what my model name here. Um, we've got our coefficient. Um, please. I guess we have to get the actual um, particular item in the pipeline. So, um, So in this case, we were fitting a line. We had the two features, so um, you know. So we've got the two coefficients. So th this should be specifying the um, uh, coefficients for the pedal length and pedal length. Um, and then, you know, we should also have uh, still the, the same um, um, intercept term, right? Um, but let's look at the support vectors and in underscore support within there. So, um, either um, given some indication of the, the support vectors that's talked about, right? Um, Right. The, 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 the um, coefficients and the intercept, um, I mean, the, the, the hinge function fits um, a model exactly like we were talking about for linear regression. So, so these have the same interpretation, like you saw, like we've been seeing before for linear regression, right? So, um, you know, if, if you look at those values, uh, those will give you basically your decision boundaries like we were visualizing um, uh, here. So, um, and then, you know, we could probably pull out the other stuff here, like the, 
support vectors that were found and things by our loss function um, from the other information that we've got here. Um, So so let's um, let me talk a little bit then about doing nonlinear SVM classification, right? So usually, uh, like linear models are, are relatively limited. So so most of the time, most real data um, is going to have some nonlinearity in it, right? So 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 models that can really only um, model phenomenon is some sort of linear separation um, or a linear fit, like a linear fit for a regression, um, are going to be pretty limited uh, usually, right? So um, the, 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 the kernel trick that's talked about here in the second part of, of chapter five um, is a pretty common thing. So, um, and it's, it's related to the idea of adding the polynomial features like we've talked to. So, so um, you know, if you don't understand anything else about this, uh, you can kind of think of this as doing something similar to what we've been doing for linear regression. So to be able to, to, to use a fitness function to actually fit a, a nonlinear model to a set of regression points is, is kind of what we've been doing with our polynomial fitting, right? So the, the so-called kernel trick is a um, um, kind of a more general way of doing that, right? Um, um, so, oops. Oh yeah, so um, so this kind of stuff that I've been been saying there. So in many cases, the day many data sets aren't close to being linear and separable, right? So um, um, so we could add more features, such as polynomial features, right? Um, and um, and then. At times, that that might allow us to have a decision boundary that's nonlinear that, that can then separate the features, or that can then better fit the data. Like if we're doing a regression problem, so, um, so yeah, the, the basic idea is something like this, right? So this is what we've been doing, uh, but but now we're thinking of this in terms of classification instead of regression. So if we had values like this, uh, they're obviously not linearly separable, right? Um, because um, um, you know, we can only have one line. There's no way we can have one line that would have all the blues on one side of the line and all the greens on, on the other side of the line, right? But um, if you add in, um, like the square of the values um, as a second feature, uh, now we can have a line that's that will linearly separate those um, in our two feature space, right? So, so in particular, this dashed red line here separates them, right? Um, so that general trick works, you know, both for regression like we've been doing, uh, but it can work um, in, um, classification problems like this as well. So, so adding kernels is kind of like adding in new features that are some sort of uh, nonlinear um, combination of an existing feature or features, right? So, so like this simple case here. Um,
So yeah, I mean, in particular, um, and, and you know, I should go ahead and I should, we should go ahead and get these examples into um, our um, lecture notebook and try yourself. So you know, you shouldn't just read through these, but you ought to try and try these out yourself. Um, so you know, as a quick example, again, we, we could use a, a linear support vector classifier like we were doing before, but try it where we give it some additional features, right? So, um, so let's try that out. Uh, here for our uh, nonlinear theme classification example here. Um, let's try visualizing this first here. So, for example, um, let's see if this works. So, you know, the make moons, uh, you might have seen an example of this before. So, this is another example of the date of, of the thing. I can't remember if we used this for that assignment where we made up um, some, some data sets for, um, uh, for classification, right? But um, as is shown um, in our figure here, uh, we've got two kinds of classes where, you know, they're, they're not linearly separable. It was what we should get from, from calling this make moons um, function, right? You can read it. So um, this creates a simple toy data set. Um, and uh, by default, um, there's two classes of the, the binary classification data set here, I believe, right? Um, and you can set, you can specify how noisy it is by the noise parameter here. So in this case, we end up with, you know, X has our 100 samples. Uh, we've got two columns. So those are the two features here. So what we need to do is do something like a, um, 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 so we're going to have to pull out the thing, you know, right? So, um, so we want only those, those things where Y is zero. Right for the first class. Um, and you know, make it, uh, let's try making it kind of the same. Let's, let's, let's do this as uh, green triangles, maybe. Um, That out quite right. So, um, um oh, right. So, oh, that's right. Um, no, oh, it's fifty by two. So, I need to do, um, I want all of the rows. And then the zeros column, and then all the rows, and then the first column. There we go. So that's that's our uh, one of the day two of the data sets. Uh, we can do something similar for the second one. Uh, just a second, let me pause here. Okay, sorry about that. Um, 
uh, get the second feature here. Uh, I've got to change it to, let's say, the blue um, squares. That's the squares. Yeah, I got them reversed from, from the figure there. So those are our two classes. Um, this is random, so we might not get exactly the same set of points unless we set the seed. I guess they didn't set the seed when they did it here. So anyway, we should get something similar. So. Switch those around so that um, we get the same marker. Um, Anyway, so what we're getting here then, is um, we're going to um, actually get all the, 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 the scaled features up to degree three. And remember, so since we have two features coming in, we're, we're actually gonna get in, um, 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 you know, we're, we're going to get the, the x squared and the x cubed for feature one and feature two. Uh, so presumably uh, the, the, our, our x, we'll call that feature one, and our y axis, feature two in this case, right? So we're actually going to be getting, you know, not only the, 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 the the original feature one and two, but we get the x squared and the x cubed, but we also get the combinations of those as well. So um, after we do uh, the scaling, you know, we get the x squared uh, times y, or the feature one squared times feature two, and we get the feature one times feature two squared, right? Um, and, and those kinds of combinations here. So anyway, that that's kind of just, um, you know, uh, um, some details about uh, kind of what's happening here, right? Uh, so if we fit um, a linear support vector classifier in this case, um, and we got the, the convergence warning. Um, so like it says here, you know, so basically, you know, if, if you've probably run across those before, right? So if you're having problems converging, that this is an, a thing about optimization, Right, and, and we've talked a little bit about optimization in this class. So the optimizer is using something like gradient descent, uh, but there's some sort of limit on the so that the um, optimizer doesn't run forever in case uh, we're having problems converging. Right. Um, so so sometimes you can fix those by doing what the message says. Um, so if we increase the number of iterations. Um, Uh, like the max iter uh, value here, that might solve it. So let, let's let's try going a little bit longer. See if we can get rid of that warning here. Ten times longer. So I see that that um, uh, it, it was able to converge. Okay, so that means that when it was doing gradient descent, um, uh, a thousand wasn't enough before. Um, so, so when we stopped at a thousand iterations, um, uh, the loss was still decreasing significantly. But um, at some point between a thousand and ten thousand, um, we we had gotten close enough so that the the loss wasn't changing in a significant amount. Whatever is being used um, as a stopping condition um, uh, for our, our loss here. So. so um, um, yeah, so to visualize the um, decision boundary that we'll find, we'll have to do, I could probably just copy and paste um, this code here for the most part uh, using this new model, I hope. 
because again, we're doing a similar kind of thing, although, um, you know, we're going to have to make sure we change all these things correctly. So, you know, we want both of these features to go from like, uh, let's say, negative two to two for the most part for our grid that we're calculating things over. Um, and in this case, um, we did change the name. So now it's called polynomial. It's VM classifier, right? Um, and then the rest of these should work, I think. the default for the uh, range for the axes here. So, um, uh, uh, the point of that being, so, so here we, we replotted the decision boundary that we're getting, right? So it's not linear anymore, even though we're using a linear classifier, because, you know, we're, we're only plotting uh, for the, the uh, feature one and feature two that we originally had, but we're actually fitting the model on, you know, the x squared and the x cubed and the combinations of feature one and feature two, right? So, um, the result is, is that the, the, the decision boundary is going to look nonlinear for our original two features that we have because it's it's been fit on that higher dimensional um, set of features that we had here. Okay, so we basically did the same thing that we've been doing uh, now for the uh, our linear regressions when we were adding polynomial features, right? And so we did that for a classifier here, adding polynomial features to a linear classifier to actually get a nonlinear decision boundary, right? Um, so it should have been pretty similar to um, what was gotten uh, here. And again, I encourage you. So here you might see uh, quite a bit of differences, though, if we like play around with C, right? So although this, this is a pretty good fit here, um, but um, if we make the decision uh, harder here, um, so we're using pretty high ones. Let's make it softer first. So let's see the one. Um, so you get that as a result, right? So um, we've mostly gotten just a few of the class ones, you know, but, but one class zero is out, right? If we make it harder then, um, you'll see that it tried harder to be wiggly, right? So, so it got, um, so it actually did better in this case uh, when we're using uh, quite a bit, right? So it almost got everything, right? If we go even harder, we, we might, um, and this is kind of the, another advantage of, the, of, of a nonlinear, um, like a kernel, like we'll use here in a second when I get to it. Um, but um, uh, so if it makes it even bigger, uh, we might even get this around and get kind of perfect, perfect classification for the points that we had that we were um, fitting our models to here anyway. Um, and again, though, you know, this not necessarily better that we get perfect classification on the data that we fit our model with, you know, that, that we're training the model with. You know? So the real test would be how it does on, on uh, test data. Uh, not, not the data that we train with, but um, um, but anyway, you can see the fit is getting better. Um, now you can see it, it, it might even be done um, a, a perfect fit here uh, now you know, on on the data that we fit the model with. Um,
So what's then? Look at this idea of, of, of kernels. Um, So yeah, there is kind of a scaling problem with the this uh, creating uh, polynomial combinations of features, right? So if you have a large number of features, the the, the number of new features that you're creating will, will grow really quickly, right? Um, so there's this other way of, of adding in kind of nonlinear combinations of features called the kernel trick, um, which was popularized with support vector machines, but it can be applied to other uh, machine learning mechanisms, basically. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, you know, if you don't understand all the details of the kernel trick after reading this, um, I mean, you know, the, the kind of the takeaway is that the kernel trick makes it possible to get kind of the same results of adding polynomial nonlinear features without actually having to add uh, like all of them, right? So it scales uh, better, right? Um, so, so yeah, there's no kind of combinatorial explosion. Um, so, uh, so, so most people, I mean, if you're going to use a support vector machine, uh, you would just use the standard from, from scikit-learn, you would just use the standard um, SVC, okay? So um, the linear SVC just does a linear support vector machine, but by default, the, the, the SVC for the support vector classifier uh, will apply um, a, a, a kernel by default. Um, um, I think by default. Uh, so here we specified applying a kernel, right? So let's try this out though. Um, so here, Um, we're doing our pipeline like we did before, but we're using, instead of using linear SVC, we're using the uh, basic SVC. SVC. Um, so like if we look at the kernel uh, parameter here, Um, so, so usually RBFs are the common radial basis functions, um, right? So, uh, but, but yeah, if you use poly, um, I mean, I, I believe it's doing polynomial kernels, which is, is almost exactly like we just kind of did by hand here. Um, So, so yeah, I mean, Basically, and, and we're also, you can specify the degree when you use a, a polynomial uh, kernel, right? So, so we're doing something pretty similar. So the coefficient zero is um, um, another one of the kind of regularization parameters. So this controls how much the model is influenced by the high degree polynomials uh, versus the lower degree uh, polynomials, right? So, um, so anyway, I mean, if you run it, you know, we should get something pretty similar if we use a degree three, and then you can make that higher to get them um, more um, uh, 
a more wiggly kind of result, right? So if, if we do that result, um, and uh, we should be able to replot with exactly the changes, our decision boundary, um, uh, except uh, our model name change. Right. So, um, unlike the textbook was showing, so we could try, um, say, higher degree um, in between uh, C. Um, and you can change the, uh, the, the coefficient of zero here, which is what the R is, I believe, that they were um, showing in the title for the figure here. Um, so they were just using different values of that for uh, the coefficient of zero. Let's see what the um, the documentation says for that coefficient of zero. Yeah, it's all used for polynomial and sigmoid. Um, Anyway, I mean, you know, right, if you make that bigger, you know, you'll see that it will be much more likely to, to be more curvy, um, you know, your decision boundary to get all these points here, for example. Um, Although, yeah, so maybe went too far there. So um, not certain exactly why it completely um, failed there, but um, three ten. So you can see uh, increasing this, um, so it's, not, it's taking some time to calculate. So presumably we're running into some of that combinatorial um, uh, problem here. So there, there's lots of um, um, polynomial coefficients being um, uh, calculated and used here. Uh, it's taking too long. So. Yep, not letting me interrupt here either. So, yep. stop finally. So, um, rerunning everything here. Um, but yeah, let's go back. Well, that, that's good enough um, to kind of illustrate um, how this is working with the polynomial kernel here. So. All right. Um, So really, the, the, the radial basis functions are the most common kind of kernel used. Um, and as is kind of discussed here in our textbook, you can kind of think of this as a similarity function. So um, what you'll end up doing then is kind of adding multiple of these. And then things that are, are, are 
close to it, we'll, we'll end up having high uh, value for, for one of the kernels. Um, so, so yeah, if you're right under the, 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 the maximum, you'll have a high similarity. Um, and if you're far away from kind of the, the, the center point of that kernel, uh, you'll have a low similarity. Um, so I don't know if it describes it more in here, but, but the result is that kind of like having polynomial features, um, basically what you can do is you can add, uh, instead of, you know, um, uh, having an explosion of the combinations of polynomial features, you can pick. So, so normally what you do is um, for, for the, the Gaussian uh, radial basis functions is I believe the default is to add one kernel um, for each feature that you have. Um, so, you know, if you have 10 features, then, then you just add, you end up having like 10 kernels. Um, that you use here instead of an explosion of polynomial features, right? Um, I believe it tells, I think, it, I think it's, you know, basically linear in the number of features that you have. Uh, and I think it talks about it in here. Um, so the, the default is to use radio basis function uh, kernel, right? So, um, Again, we could try those out. So if we do a support vector machine classifier where we use uh, RBF kernel, and that's the default, so we don't have to specify that, but, but we can use that. We can fit our function here. So again, in this case, we're doing that. Uh, the, the gamma parameter is probably discussed in our textbook, um, but that is, um, um, kind of like the coefficient zero is a term that's used for polynomial and sigmoid um, kernels. Um, the gamma is, is something that um, um, modifies the, it basically modifies the width of the radial basis function kernels here. So the so small ones make, make the similarity be, um, you know, when you go back to, um, uh, this figure here. So if, if you have like a very large value for gamma, uh, you get a very narrow uh, range. So, so most things will be have a zero similarity, but only things that are really close uh, to that feature will have a one similarity. Right? And if you use um, smaller values, or maybe I've got these reversed, but, but yeah, if you use smaller values of, of gamma, uh, th this will be kind of a, a wide base. So, so so things will be farther away and will have more similarity to the radio basis function. Um, um, so anyway, you know, so we can see the result that we get for our fit uh, support vector classifier using the radio basis function kernel here. Something like that. Um, um, in this case, yeah, since I redid the, uh, the, the, the moon's data, so some of the, the, the points were above two, so that's why my grid is not getting all of them. But, but you can see that now for the rate of basis function, we had kind of a nice uh, thing around there, although, you know, I didn't get everything completely, right? Uh, but um, um, this point is particularly troublesome. Here, right? So we're going to, have to be a much more wiggly to get that one around. So, so in this case, right? And if you do want to try and get, for example, a better fit, more wiggle in here, you'd want to increase your gamma, right? So, so if you make this um, more discriminating, um, you should get. Or you can also change the the C. So. But yeah, so it might not be possible though, to get this uh, completely around there. I'll try real big gamma. Uh, yeah, so yeah, you can see, yeah, if you get too high, you end up getting kind of things just around. So, so here we're probably overfitting 
right? So, so we've got decision boundaries around kind of the specific uh, points that we had in our data here. Um, uh, when we use too high of a value for the gamma. And um, the gamma and C are going to be important ones if you're using a uh, kernel, um, using RBF kernel functions for support vector classifiers. Yeah. So, so yeah, this is probably a better model and you know, it's a better generalizer, even though you know we've got that point in there. Although, again, we can try um, also. Um, increasing the C a bit, uh, but, but yeah, that, that, that point really looks like kind of like an outlier in this case, but, but um, it would be a tough one to discriminate for these. So that generally, you know, these kind of decision boundaries are looking pretty good for this random set of data that we have here. Um, but again, you know, as you know, I mean, all, all of these that we've been doing, I mean, they are based on the support vector machine. Uh, mar the, the maximum margin intuition here, right? So uh, in general, although some, some points might violate the margin and are kind of being ignored, but in general, it's trying to find a decision boundary that's even using these kernel functions, that's maximizing the margin between the things that are close um, um, uh, to the decision boundary being made here, right? So you'll see that uh, you know, except for some points, that's mostly uh, kind of uh, being in the middle of, of close points for these support vectors on here. Right. So if we kept extending um, our X out here, uh, we'd probably see that um, our class zero decision boundary kind of um, encircles a uh, space in our two feature dimension here. Uh, um, So that is basically the, you know, the basics of support vector machine and the, the kernel. Um, oh yeah, there's, there is, a, so yeah, you can use SVM for regression um, as well. Um, so, so you can apply SVM to regression um, problems. Um, so um, here, like it's been shown in our textbook, basically what happens is that the margin is gonna be about, um, trying to keep things, uh, you know, for the line that you're fitting, um, uh, this will specify which points outside of the margin you kind of ignore, right? Um, when you're doing a regression problem. So, so basically here, uh, the, the support vector, the decision boundary that you find uh, becomes your linear model, becomes your, your line that you're fitting to the model. Um, and then the margin, um, um, ends up being, you know, which points we take into account or not uh, for the, 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 the widest margin that we have here. So, um, so yeah, SVC is for classifier, for support vector, SVR is for doing um, uh, a regression problem using support vectors. Um, um, And, and like for the classifier, you can also use the, the, um, the kernel, to use kernels with the SVM um, to get nonlinear fits um, for even for a regression, basically. So. All right, um, I think that that was gonna be all that I was gonna cover. Um, uh, here, so I'll post this. Um, um, let, let me reiterate kind of some things that I said at the beginning before um, some people had joined. 
Um, so uh, we can talk more about the assignment for uh, next Monday when people have questions, but the assignment four has been posted now. Um, and you, can, you should go ahead and start working on it after you, um, oops, after you um, work through the material for this week. So assignment four is all about support vector machines um, and, and, and uh, applying those to classification problems, right? Um, I did update the assignment. So there always was like an assignment four um, that you could see in our assignments folder. Uh, but I, I've, I've updated it now. So you really should do a git pull, okay? So I, I would suggest that you first try it from your host machine. So um, go to your host machine and open up a terminal and go to your repository um, that you created for this class, that, that you'd clone for this class and do a git pull. That should pull down the most recent version of the assignment four. Um, if you haven't done it already, right? You, you can try and do the git pull um, from inside of your machine as well, um, your, your virtual machine. So to do that, this may or may not work depending on what you've got modified and things. Um, but if you open up a terminal, You would have to go into the ML Python classes. This is the um, this is the shared folder that's being shared between your host and your um, virtual machine. Uh, but if you go into there, you could also do the get pull from there. You should be able to. So. Right. Um, I do actually ask you to create a, a kernel function by hand, uh, but um, I'm going to let you guys, I'm not going to talk about that here. We'll, we'll talk about that on Monday. So we'll discuss the, the um, problem further, um, the, the assignment four further um, on our next um, class meeting here. Um, um, but yeah, one of the things you do have to do is, is create a function to actually implement Gaussian kernel by hand. So we'll have to go into a little bit more detail about um, what these radio basis function kernels are, like, like a Gaussian radio, radio basis function kernel and things. Okay. Um, all right, but I'll let you guys work on that first. Um, but uh, but yeah, as you're working on the assignment, um, if you have questions, go ahead and email me. Um, and uh, I think the, that'll be it for today's session. And um, um, I'll go ahead and post this video and I'll see you guys later then.